he learned how to fly. He was flying small planes. The plane uh, didn't perform as it was supposed to. We crashed like 70 something seconds after takeoff into a neighborhood kind of off of the end of the runway. He was aiming for like a field beyond this house, but he mm -hmm. kind of clipped the, the edge of this house. From what they told me, there were like some propane tanks in the garage and that added to the fire. The plane landed on his side and everybody on that side of the plane passed away. I turned around and got Cody out of his car seat because he was in a car seat in, it, in the seat behind me. And I put his stuffed animal over his face and I got him out of the plane and I told her, just a second, honey, I'll come back for you. But apparently I was calm and normal and absolutely ridiculous in the middle of a plane crash. Cody and I were burned. Um, Cody on about 11.5% of his body and I on like 26.5% of my body. And then I also degloved my heel, which means I like sliced the skin off of my heel because um, I was wearing flip-flops like it was the middle of summer. Surviving a plane crash is a story that few people get to tell, but that is the story that you will hear today. Back in 2020, during COVID, Becky lost her husband and nine-month-old daughter in a fiery plane crash. Now, she tells her story better than I can, but what I found interesting is the way that she has been able to deal with such tragedy and remain positive. She has a vibe that reaches out and touches you as soon as you meet her. It's pretty undeniable. Um, I found this inspiring. I found it valuable. So I asked her to do an interview with me so that I could bring it to you guys today on Chopping It Up. First of all, thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate you making the time and we've had to dance around a few things, but we've got here, we've made it happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. So introduce yourself a little bit and tell me, you know, a little bit about your growing up, where you're from, name, age, things like that. Okay. Um, I'm Becky. I'm 40. I grew up around Pittsburgh. I lived there until I was 17. When I was 17, I was like an early graduate, so I went to the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, mm. and that was super fun, hard, challenging, fun. My parents were like, we're not paying for college, and I was like, all right, cool. Okay. So my uncle was like, you better get into college on your own. How about you look at this Coast Guard Academy thing? And I was like, all right. So it's the only place I applied. Um, so you've liked water ever since the beginning, huh? Oh, I loved water. I'd never right. been in it. Like, couldn't swim when I went to the Academy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay, that's I, interesting. My only swimming experiences were in the summer, we would do these reenactments, and we'd go up to Fort Niagara. And we had this one friend, uh, um, Kit, and he taught me how to barely dog paddle in right. the pool. Enough to let you get in there. Yep. So when I got in the Coast Guard Academy, I was a rock swimmer and mm -hmm. I had to, <laughs> that means you sank to the bottom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to take an extra six months of swimming. And now I wouldn't live anywhere else besides on the water. Right. I love it. It's been a goal ever since I went to college is to live on the water. Yeah, and I have videos of you last year or year before that wakeboarding and all that type of stuff, so yeah. you're into the water sports oh, I as love well. It. I love all the water sports, absolutely. Definitely a huge passion of mine. So the Coast Guard becomes a job? Yeah, Coast Guard was a job for, I did five years after my academy time of active duty service, which is okay. what you're supposed to do after you graduate. And then uh, I uh, wanted to transition to the reserves because I was dating a guy in D.C. So uh, I stayed in the reserves uh, and uh, I started working as a uh, civilian at Coast Guard headquarters. Hmm. And what's that entail? What are you doing at Coast Guard? Like, um, are you all taking calls about... Boats <laughs> no, or? it's more just the management of the Coast Guard. So oh, okay. I was doing HR stuff at Coast Guard headquarters. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was fun. And then you do that up until how long ago? How long ago did that stop? Um, uh, I did it the whole way into my accident. Okay, so oh. moving forward to the accident. What happens there? So, like, summarize beforehand. Because I'm, I'm not sure exactly who was involved in all of this or how all of this yeah. happened. But... I think it's a lot, and I think that people understanding that you can go through that much and still come out smiling and being the person that you are and having the vibe that you are, I think that's what's most important. Yeah. In 2016, we do this wakeboarding thing every year. We go out on the lake mm -hmm. on New Year's Eve, or New Year's Day, really, and we wakeboard. It's like a way to start the, the new year off right. When it's freezing. But it's freezing cold out. <laughs> right. um, but usually if it's like 50 or 60 and the water is like 63-ish, so the water's warmer than the air, and it's not that bad. And we all go and we get one wakeboard set in to start the new year off right. Okay. So uh, um, I was out on John's boat, our friend John, mm -hmm. and uh, I met Lee. 
and uh, Lee was the love of my life. So met him, knew he was an interesting guy. Um, we rode together that day and I was like, oh, I like this one. And um, so we ended up doing like a lot of the same things. Like I'd be like, oh, I'm going to go up, you know, snowboarding at Liberty. Mm. And he's like, me too. Well, let's ride together. So we would go do that stuff. So we would uh, go and I'd, I'd cook dinner or we'd play soccer together. And we just like did more and more stuff together. And about three months in, I was like, I love you. And he wasn't ready for that yet, and uh, it was uh, not a perfect romance, but my romance. Um, we were everything to each other. So we always wanted more time, never less. Right. Yep. So uh, when we first started dating, we were like, look, like I'm getting deployed in a year. I was going to head off to Cuba. I was like, I'm getting deployed in a year. This is going to be nothing. I'm getting deployed in a year. We're breaking up after this. I'm getting deployed in the air. We don't matter. But we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, um, we talked every day while I was deployed. So you just tried to cut it off beforehand. So like, well, so we you didn't both, really want to, but you thought about it. We both knew like November time frame, like when I was getting ready to go, that okay. like we didn't want to go. Right. So uh, we were like, ah, oh, maybe we'll like, get pregnant and I won't, be, I won't have to go. <laughs> so <laughs> we were... <laughs> Any excuse to stay together. Yeah, we thought about it, you know. Um, but then, uh, you know, I, I went on deployment. We talked every day. And in that case, heartness did, or what do they call it? Uh, space makes the heart grow fonder. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we had space. And uh, that was like one of my complaints. I had like a seven-year relationship before and I walked away from it. We were engaged. And I was like, if I would have had the time and space to like think about our relationship, I would have broken it off a lot sooner, I mm, think. Okay. But I never had the like space to, to want that person. Right. You know? So, so that you can make that choice if you really did or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, does that person add to your life? Is this person really important mm. to you? Or are you just getting by? Mm. Or are you just settling? Right. So I knew I wasn't settling for Lee. So we, uh, I, I came back from Cuba eight weeks pregnant. We got married at 11 weeks pregnant on, at a little ceremony on the lake here. Just, I, I surprised everybody on Thanksgiving and I was like, hey, we're having a surprise wedding. Come. Mm. <laughs> like they didn't know until they were here. Hmm. Um, we got it catered from Lou's Soul Food in um, Doswell. She like drove it up here for us. It was like this little spot that we like to eat at. And uh, it was just a teeny tiny awesome wedding. Like I wore my Elvine boots and my white jeans and we <laughs> took out uh, the trash to the dump the morning of so that we would have space in the garbage cans and we wrote our vowels on the way to the dump. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was awesome. Um, so was great. Y'all just hooked up in the in the world is a certain couple that needed to be together, right? Yeah. That's the way it felt. Yeah. Hmm. It was completely, you know, crazy meeting. Like he was friends with my friends and he had moved to Utah or he'd moved to Colorado first and then Utah. Okay. And then he had just come back. Okay. Um, like a couple months before to the DC area. And he knew all my lake friends down here because he had lived at the lake before. And I was like... That's and they crazy. already knew him and liked him too. Yeah. Yeah, well, that made yeah. it easier. So, as my well. friends were his friends, which was uh, really cool. No doubt. But, yeah, so absolute, like, I had the best four years together. Like, just we did everything together. Mm -hmm. We, it was fun working on crap in the garage until 2 a.m. Like, mm -hmm we would go and buy crap off of Facebook and turn it around and make money off of it. Like he knew how to fix anything. Mm. Um, definitely, man. Yeah, definitely like a guy you can respect. Like total twisted sense of humor, loved it. Um, you know, we were just always in each other's corners. Um, and so while I was away in Cuba, he tried to fill the hole in his heart by buying things. So he bought a Jeep, a house, a dog, Marley, over there, and um, he learned how to fly. So he was flying small planes, okay. and it's something that he wanted to do to see his daughter more. 
Okay, um, made it easier to get back and forth? Yeah, so she was living in Florida at the time, oh. and he visited her religiously every mm. month. He talked to her every Tuesday, every Thursday, every single chance he could get, he would talk to her. Um, she's just the sweetest little kid and uh, amazing. Mm. So, I, like, I, I consider her like my first daughter because okay. we were around, I knew her since the time she was like two. Mm. Um, and just the most amazing little girl. So, um, but anyways, so um, we had a ton of fun. We flew all the time. Um, he was getting up there in hours. He had like almost 500 hours. He had just learned his um, uh, instrumental stuff for flying. So it means you can like fly through clouds and you talk to the FAA when you're doing oh, okay. it. And um, so he was, imagine like, a lot of steps that. to get to be able to fly by yourself, anyways, right? Don't you yep. have to log so many hours or? Yep, you log hours. So you do cross country flights. Uh, you do a whole bunch of stuff to okay. like be able to go on your own. But then you could only fly like VFR, so only like in the day when there aren't clouds, mm. like mm -hmm. nice times, good weather. So it's when, like when you can see instead of having to use instruments. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. And then he learned to instrument fly. Um, we traveled down to the flight school together. Like I took the RV, he took mm -hmm. the plane, mm -hmm. we had the kids, uh, mm -hmm. we did the whole thing. Um, and he learned how and he, you know, studied and studied and studied and took his test and did all that stuff. Um, he was super cautious, like wanted to make sure we were okay, but he loved flying and it was fun. Like we had so many I good doubt. family adventures. Like we would go down to Ocracoke for like a couple hours at a time, you know, mm -hmm. go down, have like lunch down there and then leave at sunset to come back here. Mm -hmm. Like it was gorgeous. Um, it was a really cool lifestyle, but yeah, um, no doubt. yeah, I still love it. My kid still loves to fly. Like it's just, mm -hmm. I've never been in a plane. Never ever, I've never even flown, a big plane. Never flown in my life. It's crazy, right? But my father actually, uh, he tried to learn how to fly and something happened. He couldn't see as well when he got older. So they yeah. stopped teaching him or something. But yeah, I was going to, you know, when he was doing it, I was like, yeah, I'll go fly with you. Sure. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I've never even been in a plane, not a helicopter, none of that. Oh man. It's incredible. I don't know. I like that bird's eye view. Mm, I bet. Yeah. I think it's crazy to look at even drone shots of things, you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's such a perspective that, for me especially, I've never seen or I'm not used to seeing, so yeah. I think those videos are cool. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, COVID hit, right? Mm -hmm. And we still traveled everywhere because we were in our own plane, so we didn't have to worry about infecting anybody nice. or do anything. So we would go down to Florida and then we would go out to uh, Skylar was with us that summer, like before our accident. So we got to spend a ton of time with her. It was like the first time that we had gotten to spend like seven weeks with her because okay. she was finally old enough to spend time with us for that right. long a period. Um, cause she was in school. So that was super fun. Just like everything going as a family. Like we had our first son, um, Cody, and then we had our daughter Coral. Um, Coral was nine months old, a little spitfire. Mm -hmm. Um, just like live in that family vibe, like happy, having fun, doing all the things that we wanted to do. Right. Like never a dull moment. Awesome. The dream. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The absolute dream. <laughs> and then when everything comes to a head, like what, what happens there? How does the, the day in question go down when everything so we went to Utah um, to visit a friend of his. Um, boyfriend uh, has a sweet daughter out there. We went out to say hi. Um, we know a lot of people in Utah. He had properties out in Utah. Like we would go skiing out there all the time. Uh, um, so he made time for his friend in Utah. We went out and we were gonna go fly over the Grand Canyon. Um, and he had just learned his instrument stuff. So he called up the FAA and he was like, Hey, I want to do this. And they, they give you like a certain flight plan, like in the Grand Canyon, you fly like one way at this altitude and then you fly the other way at this altitude. And it's like a whole map that you fly that's, you know, perfectly laid out. Right. And we were close enough to do that. It wasn't that far away. Um, flight time wise, it, like flying really shrinks the world. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a hot day. Um, which means the, the air is fairly dense, which can affect engine performance. Okay. So he did like all the calculations to, 
you know, make sure that we weren't too heavy and that everything was going to go okay. So it's like a big math sheet that says, yes, you can fly, no, you can't fly. The checklist type thing. Yep. So you go through the checklist. He's like, yep, we can fly. Let's go do it. So the things that I remember about that day are him filling out the checklist, um, showing it to me. I was working on a paper for some Coast Guard uh, extra education stuff. Mm. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's go. Um, get everything together, we get in the car, but other than getting in the car that morning to go to the airport, I don't remember anything hmm. until I woke up in the hospital. Really? Not a thing. My brain is like, nope, you don't need to see that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting and amazing. I think that I would have a lot harder recovery and that I wouldn't be able to... Uh, process like I have if mm. I remember the actions of that day. I think there would be some more PTSD there. Sure. I think there would be a lot more just... Nightmares. Yeah. Because that was kind of one of my questions is I've been through things. It's nothing like that, but things that have made me have dreams Yeah. that lasted for even years. Yeah. Wow. So the fact that that just... Hmm, that's a blessing for sure, right? Yeah. It's a miracle. Like that I don't remember any of what happened until I woke up in the hospital. And that, I mean, that's no picnic, but the, to not have that accident in my head is a true blessing. Right. So. So who, who, who perished in the plane? And then I know you got burnt and like, how, what, what was the aftermath? What did the aftermath look like? So we took off the plane, uh, didn't perform as it was supposed to. Um, the, the official kind of saying from what happened is that we took off uh, with the wind in the wrong place. Hmm. The FAA told us to do that, but we probably should have questioned it. But because he was a new IFR pilot, hmm. he didn't question it. Right. And the wind had shifted. Um, like a, a quick shift type thing. And it just, that was enough that, that for the conditions that day, the plane wasn't going to perform as it needed to perform. Mm. So, uh, we crashed like 70 something seconds after takeoff, um, into a neighborhood kind of off of the end of the runway. Um, he was aiming for like a field beyond this house, but he mm. kind of clipped the, the edge of this house. Um, from what they told me, there were like some propane tanks in the garage and that added to the fire. Um, he, the plane landed on his side and everybody on that side of the plane passed away. So my husband, my daughter Coral, who was nine months, and uh, his friend Milda um, were all on that side of the plane. Um, from what Milda's daughter tells me, um, I turned around and got Cody out of his car seat because he's in a car seat in, it, in the seat behind me. And I put his stuffed animal over his face and I got him out of the plane and I told her, just a second, honey, I'll come back for you. And I got Cody out and then I, somebody else was there from the neighborhood and mm. helped to get Veda out. But apparently I was calm and normal and absolutely ridiculous in the middle of a plane crash. Um, but so I was able to, to get him out and, uh, um, then they had me like laid down in, uh, to, to get to the, to get to the hospital. And then we got medevac I think both Cody and I got medevac to the hospital and then maybe Veda took a ambulance cause she was not hurt as bad. She just like hurt her hip and got mm. smoke inhalation. Mm -hmm. Um, but Cody and I were burned, um, Cody on about 11 and a half percent of his body and I on like 26 and a half percent of my body. Mm. Um, and then I also degloved my heel, which means I like sliced the skin off of my heel. Um, cause I was wearing flip flops like it was the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. moving somewhere along the line there. Yeah, I slice through metal. Yep. Um, but so I woke up in the hospital, and of course my first question was, is everybody alive? Right. Um, and I remember not being able to open my eyes, but like writing their names on a whiteboard, like trying to get it out. Hmm. Um, couldn't talk. I was intubated. They had put me in a coma for three days. Um, 
they had sliced my arms open so I didn't get compartment syndrome um, from the swelling. Um, just super, super bad. So how long do you stay in the hospital with those burns? And that? That's got to be terrible. I had my, my uncle had a third degree burn when I was young and he said it was one of the worst pains of his life. So he yeah. said 26%. 26 and a half, yep. Wow. So I... Um, yeah, I was in the hospital for a long time. I've never actually added up the days because mm. I don't want to know, but it's about 45. Okay. But it's just what I always say. I'm like, it's about 45. Because mm. I don't want to add the exact days. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. And, and then moving forward, like, what do you think it is that, I mean, I guess it's not in your head. You can't think about it like that. So it doesn't affect you that way, but it's still people missing from your life, right? It's still a, a great world that you had created that just, yeah, went down in flames, literally. Yeah. And, and you, you, you have this attitude where you're still, you know, a, a cool person to be around. You have this vibe. <laughs> All right, break time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, me too. Quick break while we reset, man. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to slap that like button like it stole something, man. You know, subscribe, you know, drop a comment. All those things help me to get this content out there. I like making content around people that are inspiring, people that have changed their lives or went through things and been able to manage to stay up, man. And I like to bring you that content. If that is a criteria that you feel like you fit or you have an inspiring story or a place you can take us like some of the other videos that I have done, you know, let me know. Hit me up on Instagram at Jamie Folks, man. So... With that, let's get back to the lake house with Becky. What, what I was just thinking about while I was outside real quick is you still got John. You still got other people like the friends and everybody there too that yeah. supports you every day, right? Oh, yeah. That's uh, that's one of the blessings that I didn't know that I had before this. Like Because we were such a tight family, mm. we would hang out together a lot. So I didn't necessarily have like a lot of people that I depended on outside of our close family unit. But when this happened, my best friends from every walk of life went together. They made this huge GoFundMe page for me. Mm. Like, all the Academy people that I knew, uh, like, right. everybody pulled together. They got me uh, so much help. They mm. got me uh, money through the service member's life insurance. They got me... Um, funds for just donations uh, that the, the Coast Guard alumni like put together, mm -hmm. like just every walk of life. Like I felt like every person that I had ever touched came back and was like, hey, like, right. how can I help? What can I do? Come like come back everybody at the lake got together for this big thing so that they could video me for my birthday in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Like all sorts of friends that, you know, it, you know, different parts of your life yeah. all here. And after I got back, like, I just, uh, you, you knew who your friends were. Like, a friend of mine helped me move all my crap from Utah because we stayed out in Utah after we got out of the hospital for months um, with friends of Lee's that mm -hmm. I, I felt like before the accident, I, I knew we would go have dinner with them, but I didn't know them. And now they're family. Right. Like. They are my family. I went down to help out her mom in Florida after she lost her house in the hurricane just a week ago for a week. I was just like, hey, somebody's got to babysit mm -hmm. Cody. Like, I have to go help her out for a week. Um, but they're people that, you know, weren't family before. They were just, you know, kind of close friends. And they barged their way into the hospital during COVID when nobody was supposed to be visiting. And they didn't leave my son's side the entire time he was in the hospital like rotating shifts, did not leave his side, made sure he had every bit of medicine that he needed to have, made sure that he was okay, that he was sleeping, like they did everything for us. Like yeah, we stayed at their house for too. months after we got out of the hospital. Yeah, because when John first told me about this, it was, uh, that was emotional enough for him just telling us who you were, who we were gonna go meet. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was cool. Yeah. And it, it, I knew right then that, you know, there was something different about you just from John. <laughs> yeah. 
and everything that had gone on in your life. And that's kind of what we talk about a lot is, you know, overcoming all that kind of stuff and moving on with life. Yeah. I mean, is it like, so what do you use to cope daily? Do you have a, I don't know, do you meditate? Do you um, do anything that so focuses your brain? I guess I have a philosophy that okay. nothing that I can do would change what has happened. Hmm. So why would I not move forward in the best possible way mm -hmm. that I can move forward? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's not a single thing I can do to change what happened. So I have to live in the present. Like I have to mm -hmm. make a good life for me and my son. Mm -hmm. Like I have to just move through it, move forward, do the best you can possibly do. Cause giving up would be giving up on him, right? Yeah, and giving up is ruining your future and ruining your now instead of just making the best of the situation. If you're, if you're willing to, to give up and willing to just ruminate in the sadness, then what are you, what are you doing for yourself? I don't know, I kind of described it to one of my friends. I said, when I was little, I went to ballet and they teach you when you spin in ballet and you're spinning, he, he said, I, I feel like I'm spinning out of control. And I was like, yeah, but get, get some control back. Like when you're spinning, they tell you to spot a spot on the wall, and turn around and spot that spot again, turn around, and spot that spot again. I said, well, just take your next right decision as your spot on the wall. Every little right decision will finally get you to a place where you're not spinning out of control. So just do what you can each day. One little tiny step. So all of that has made me go one little step at a time. Like even in the hospital, like it's, it's still massive grief. Like you're still going through just a terrible situation and but you look at it and you say you know what people die in car crashes every day like the reason why my mm -hmm. crash is so shocking is because it was plane crash mm -hmm. those don't happen every day they rarely happen but it got a lot of people's attention and a lot of people were like how are you even functioning I'm like because there's just not a choice like you either function or you let yourself shrivel up like you you it's have mindset to keep moving forward. Yeah, it's totally a mindset. But I mean, everybody will tell you that I'm positive to a fault. Mm -hmm. Like, that's been my default for a really long time. Mm. Um, I feel like so that's that makes not it a, a little really easier. bad attribute, though. No, it's... Like, nobody, <laughs> nobody runs from a person like that. You know what I mean? They're it's a good thing. they run towards that person. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I feel like you can help by just being a little bit positive. Like, and, and even... There was a, a girl in the hospital and uh, she was a lot younger than me. She had just graduated high school or was still in high school. Um, and this is her story, so I don't know how much of this you should or could share. Mm -hmm. But um, she was burned in a, in a food truck. Um, the propane tank exploded. Mm, while and she was so, in there cooking. Yeah. And so she had burns that were very similar to mine. Mm. So like while I was probably like two or three weeks ahead of her in the hospital. Um, and the burn unit's really small. They can only take care of so many people at once. Um, and I would walk by cause I had to do, I had to walk in order to not get these like shots in your belly, mm -hmm. um, to not get blood clots or something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so you'd walk around and you'd try to move and do your best you could. Um, and her lights were always off. I was like, why are her lights off? It's so strange. Um, and so I would see her in physical therapy like every day we'd have to go to physical therapy mm -hmm. and, Physical therapy in a burn unit is like one of the worst things you can do. They're like asking you to stretch because your hands can like, like condense down and you won't be able to stretch because the skin heals tighter. Mm -hmm. So you have to like try to fight for range of motion. Mm. Um, so right after you get your skin grafts, you're trying to get range of motion and, that's and you're painful. like, we were like peeling through scabs. Yeah. Like you're like breaking things open, trying to do this. Like mm -hmm. burn, burn care is terrible. Mm -hmm. Like they, they do this thing called debriding, which is like scraping your skin to get your skin ready for grafts. And the grafts are like from healthy parts of your body 
that they cheese grate off your skin and then graft it onto other parts of your skin. Like it is, I, it is terrifying mm -hmm. to go through. Like I'm still terrified that Cody will have to go through it. Yeah, so he has to go through more of it? So he's small. when you are a kid and you go through this and your body can grow too quickly for the skin grafts, mm -hmm you could have to get regrafted because your skin won't grow properly depending mm -hmm. on you know how fast you grow and how old you are when it happens right because like, basically it's a patch that stays the same size right no it'll grow with you but okay. it's not like your real skin like it, i'm 25 percent more likely to get skin cancer because of mm -hmm. the grafts because they you know your this skin even though it healed and it's closed it went through a lot right. in doing that like so the reason why this is kind of like X's is because when they take the skin from like here, it's mm -hmm. like this small, and then they grate it so it's like the cross hatches, so it gets bigger, and then they can put it on you, and they staple it mm -hmm. onto your body, mm -hmm. and then your body fills in those little gaps that they've oh, okay. made. Like a mesh, skin mesh. Or yes, like a skin mesh. And then they have to take the staples back out. And, and that, that is heals. horribly painful. Mm. <laughs> the, whole... the skin is just kind of interweaving in there and holding that all together over time until it's healed. Yep. Does it hurt today? No. No. Okay. It does, like touching my skin doesn't hurt. I don't have the same... Um, nerves that you have, like if you gently touch your mm. regular skin, like okay. if I, if you gently touch my skin, I may or may not feel it. Mm. Like I can feel pressure, but right. I don't, it's but not that, the same. That topical rubbing. Yeah. So those nerves are gone that, and some of the, like the hair follicles are gone. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then sometimes I have like butt hairs on my arm because the skin <laughs> on my arm is from my butt. <laughs> so, you know. Shave it all the way to butt hairs. <laughs> You're like, I gotta shave that off. That doesn't right? look right. That one doesn't look like a normal arm hair. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, but I man. mean, for a year after the accident, I had to wear compression garments mm. to prevent the scar tissue from like building up a lot. So it was just like long sleeves, gloves, like pants to go over. Cause I'm burned literally from like the tip of my pinky toe the whole way up to my hip. And then so from then, my hands, the whole way up to my shoulder. So it's and the whole right side. The whole right side. And then there's even some of my face, which is a little harder to tell, but you can mm -hmm. kind of tell where they grafted here mm -hmm. and across here and up across my like forehead here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Burns are crazy. It's <laughs> such a pain. Like just touching the friggin' burner when you're cooking something is so painful. They give you a lot of medicine. Yeah, right, huh? Yeah. That was something I was terrified of. I was terrified of being hooked on meds afterwards because, mm. like, oxy especially, like, they give it to you and your pain instantly goes away. Right. You're like, oh, there's no more pain anymore. Yeah, So emotional or mental or physical. Um, I found it to just be physical. Okay, but so the, the mental stuff still stayed there. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's a lot. Right. Yeah. I mean, I used to just do it till I fell asleep. Yeah. Bye. Till it would come to <laughs> me and I'd forget about everything and wake up to things worse than they were. So yeah. glad you didn't carry that over. Oh, you know, I was terrified of it. But from the get go, but at the same time you knew you needed it, but it was just for what you needed it for. Yeah. 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 I've always been kind of a nomads kind of person though. Like I don't mm -hmm. like taking Tylenol. Like it's mm -hmm. just a, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a, a big on the pharmaceutical stuff either. No. You know, the monetization of the industry is a terrible thing, I think, you know? Yeah. Because it's go to the doctor, go to the, pop, 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 keep on going around this circle. And yeah. everything I've ever been on only lasts so long before I need twice as much. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. It always takes more. No, I think that's true. Yeah. I'd much rather have my elderberry syrup for my colds than right. <laughs> taking cough syrup, but... So yeah. what's a normal day look like now, man? I mean, you know, you get up and are you, are you working? Are you, what well, are you doing now? Here's the deal. Like the accident was this terrible thing, but you can take out of it blessings if you choose to. So uh, Lee was very smart with his money mm. and he had investments and he had properties nice. and I'm able to manage those properties to make sure that I right. can stay retired. Sweet. 
my office was so incredibly understanding. The Coast Guard donated almost two years of leave to me. Nice. Like everybody in the Coast Guard got together and they were like, here's your sick leave, here's my sick leave, here's my sick leave. Mm. And I was able to use that sick leave. That's so awesome that this giant community of people came together to, you know, when I was the in the best hospital, they could be the commandant time. of the Coast Guard called me and the okay. vice commandant. They both called me while I was in the hospital. Like, that's unheard of. Right. Like, that's really cool for them to take time out of their schedule and be right. like, hey, I heard you went through this really traumatic thing. I want to say we hope you're okay. Right. Like, I want to give you the time you need to heal. Yeah. So once I got back here and was, like, taking care of myself, um, which is, you know, it's its own battle to try to take care of yourself with scars. Like for the first mm. year and a half, like my skin would still open up in places. Like I still had like places where it was like trying to heal and it was like bloody scabs and mm. you're like ruining clothes and Cody's in his little compression garments that he's outgrowing. Um, it's just... It was a lot. So how, how does he, how has he dealt with it? Has he been, does he so understand? Cody remembers the accident. Um, he remembers my hair burning. Mm. He remembers the smoke. Mm. He, he'll tell you things like, oh, the plane wasn't going fast enough. Like he remembers the accident. Um, but he still wants to go flying. Mm. He uh, is a little kid. Right. Like they bounce back yes um i feel like if you don't make it such a huge deal that in their minds it's not such a mm -hmm. huge deal same thing if they fall down and you're like oh my god yeah versus get up yeah they respond differently you're just like hey this is how it works no yeah, that's not to say they see you scared then they're scared yeah and that's not to say he hasn't had problems with his burns like going to school it's been a little tough mm. um he gets questions mm. at school about his burns and then they make it like explaining that to people kind of makes him sad right so he'll like wear long sleeves and long pants sometimes because Just to avoid most that. of that will cover any burn scars that he has um so yeah it's kind of like having a kid is weird because you you go through your grief like as an adult you go through your mm -hmm. grief and you just go through it but it like having a kid they go through their grief and then they have more questions at different stages. It's like a different level of grief at each stage of their aging. Like, hey, my dad's gone. Hey, my sister's gone. Mm. Like, I don't look like every other family looks. Like, I have these scars. Like, and it's having to explain that in a new way every time. Like, when he was little, you had to explain, hey, daddy's not coming back. Right. And now you have to explain, like, hey, like, it's you know, daddy's still not going to be here, but it's okay. We've got each other. Like mm. people will eventually stop looking at your scars. Like it's not that big a deal. And then you have to like show them by example, be like out there in your tank tops and your bikinis. Right. Like it's not that big a deal. Like don't worry about Which it. Which you very much do. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, it's, it's funny. Some, somebody helped me out a lot when I, you know, first had all these scars because like, burn scars are just, like, a thing. Like, you talk about them at burn camp, and, you, you like, because they're pretty, you know, it's it's pretty vicious looking sometimes. Right. But um, my, my friend told me, he goes, you know, scars are the tattoos you earn. Hmm. And I said, well, damn. Like. Damn. I didn't earn none of mine. It's, pr it's pretty good, right? Mm, yeah. Scars are the tattoos you earn. I've always said as a tattoo artist that you do earn it because you got to sit there through it, you got to pay for it. But Jesus. Yeah. It's nothing, nothing comparatively. And I think my tattoos are pretty good. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> awesome. They're cool. Yeah, have you ever thought about having the scars tattooed or anything like that um, to see if possibly you could do that? You can. Mm -hmm. I, I know people that have done it before. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Okay. I don't know. They don't right. bother me. Okay. Um, and they, the only reason they don't bother me is because none of my friends look at me a bit no, different. No, of course not. Like, they just, you, once you see them, like, you get used to it. And I don't, I don't think half of them could tell you where I'm scarred at. Hmm. Like, I don't know. After a while, you just don't see them anymore. 
And how about like in public for you? Like, let's say you're standing at the line at the grocery store. Every once in a while you get somebody that stares or every once in a while you get somebody that asks. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, for me, I think that people are just curious. Like they're just going to ask. You'd probably be the quick one to educate them too, wouldn't you? Well, and right I just, there in the moment. I just tell them what happened. Like, right. I don't feel like it's rude to ask because okay. I feel like it's kind of like a natural question to sure. ask. I don't know. Some people don't feel that way though. So, you know, don't go asking about people's scars right. in public, I guess. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Some people are really like traumatized by their scars and really mm -hmm. that hurts. But for me personally, it doesn't hurt. I'd rather just explain it. But then sometimes it gets a little too intense. I have to be like, and that's all there is about that. <laughs> Especially when it first happened, it was like harder for me to talk about it. Sure. Yeah. Right. And just like you said, you know, it's a reminder to be asked, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of fun when uh, little kids ask and you can say, well, I was actually a mermaid. Mm. And when I came out of the water, not all my scales fell off. Mm. And you should see how quick they run back to their parents. Go, well, well, no, it's a mermaid. <laughs> it's a mermaid. It's a mermaid. <laughs> so that's why I say when I don't really want to explain anything. but mm -hmm. Or when it's a kid and you think it's funny. Ways to cope though, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, they say it gets easier over time. And sometimes yeah and sometimes no. Like... I like to look at it as like when it first happens, it's like waves coming in, like a big storm of waves. Mm. So you get like the water is super high and it's crashing over you and it feels overwhelming. And the, the waves over time, they get, you know, a little bit further apart or they get a little less heavy. Mm. And, you know, finally you can come back to like a normal level. And every once in a while, one still smacks you upside the head. It knocks you down. Yeah. But, but it's you not, feel like you're just right there in that current fighting your way yeah. to keep your head above water. Yeah. I mean, at first. And then eventually it gets a little better, a little better. And then you get to a rest better. a little bit. Yeah. Sit on the beach. Yeah. Water's still up to your neck. But you, you get to sit But I there. like to swim. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's probably <laughs> why you use that. So, like, if you had a, a philosophy or, a, a, you know, something you could tell the world, what would that be? mission statement or, you know, <laughs> something in, along those lines live in the present if you can't change it mm -hmm. why are you trying why are you ruminating on it keep moving forward i never did finish telling you about the girl in the the ward with me mm. um so we saw each other at physical therapy and uh, she didn't know what my story was but i always tried to encourage her a little bit i said yeah you're almost through it you almost got this you know, just a little bit more, stretch a little bit more. Um, and I was always positive. And uh, I guess right after, oh, I, when I was leaving, I gave her my fake flowers. You can't have real flowers in the burn ward because of allergens and stuff mm. in the air. Um, so I gave her my flake, fake flowers and she finally got around to asking the nurses what my story was. Um, Cause we just didn't have an opportunity to share. Mm -hmm. And uh, they shared with her my story. And I guess like just her hearing that and being like, how was she still positive after losing her family? That helped her to put some perspective on her life and be like, hey, if she can do this after that, I can do this. Like I didn't lose anywhere near that much. Like I can, I can do this. And that little bit, that just, just me being normal me mm -hmm. helped her to get through it. And that's why there's cameras on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I should share this or not either, but I have a friend of mine that I want to show this podcast to because she recently lost her son. Oh, man. Um, he took his own life. And he texted her and said, I love you, Mom. I'm going to myself and she's going through it this Saturday we got to go to a you know a get together or something for him yeah so if you could talk to her what would that say what would you say that my heart breaks her it sucks I don't know there's nothing that she could do now you know mm-hmm 
you just, it's not your fault. Yeah, for sure. We can't take blame. Yeah, I think she does feel some of that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, like I said, sometimes these get heavy for me too. Yeah. It's heavy. No, something that helped me a lot before the accident even, um, just in understanding people. Um, we have, we, me and Lee had this really good friend that he worked with when he was out in Utah. Um, and he was a, a therapist that worked for the state of Utah and mm -hmm. was just good friends with Lee. His name is George Smith. Mm -hmm. And he wears yellow all the time. And he was like, I don't know, 90 something when we knew him. Um, and he said one time that people are just doing the best that they can with what they've been given in their lives. Um, and their best isn't your best. Um, they're, they're trying their level best. So even if it seems like they're acting against you or if they're trying to hurt you, they're, they're trying to do what's best for either them or what's, what they've been able to do in their lives. And it's based on their experiences and their level of brain power and their, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their life. So don't look at things like, you know, why didn't you do this? This is what I would have done in this situation. You have to look at it like, hey, they're just trying the best that they know how to do. And sometimes they're not capable of doing any better than what they've done. I have trouble with that one. Yeah, I know. I have a lot of trouble with that one. I think a lot of people do. Like, if you hold yourself to a high standard and then somebody does something crappy to you, they, they're not holding themselves to that high standard. They're not holding themselves to your standard. You're holding yourself to your standard. And every part of my brain wants to argue with you right now about certain people in my life that I want them to do better. And I'm just watching them do bad. And I've been encouraging them for years. Yeah. And they continue to do bad. And I know it's my expectation that they should be yeah. doing what I would do or what I think is right. Or what you think they're capable of. Right. And I guess that thought makes me think that like, I feel like I'm capable of anything. So other people are too. So what you're, yeah. you know, basically what you're saying is that's not the way it is. I just have trouble with that. I know. I have a lot of trouble with that one. I know. Cause it's hard. Cause you yeah. still have to have expectations for people, but where are your realistic expectations and where are their realistic expectations? And that's kind of hard. And you got to know nobody's perfect. Like, mm. So accept them for who they are. Yeah. Love meet them, them where they're what at. They do. Help them as much as you can and keep it moving. Yeah. I don't know. I think we take a lot of ownership over other people's issues sometimes. And there's, there's a lot that can be done and there's a lot that can't be done. Mm. Sometimes it's too late too, right? Like some people are raised a certain way and, and they're not taught consequences or I think that, and that turns leads them, them to where they're at but I think you can always strive to be better like I don't know for some people it's just like an instantaneous switch like for me for the accident like I was like hey why am I spending time working like that's one of the reasons why I stayed retired is because I want to be a part of my son's life I want to live life to right. the fullest like I want to be out here wakeboarding and skiing yeah. and teaching my Smiling kid all these things. Uh, yeah, like showing right. people what a life well lived means. Yeah, man. Good shit. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to open up for this, man. I think this is, I know a lot of people in my audience that'll love this. Nice. So. I don't know. I like to be honest. Yeah. I, that's, I kind of lived that way too, man. I didn't all my life uh, and I didn't like the way that felt. So yeah. I, I'm the same way now, man. I don't lie. And I hate it when one of my friends asked me to lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, no, dude, I don't want to lie for you. Yeah. I think it's a way of living as well, you know? Yeah. Just try to keep it real. Hmm. I don't know, someday I'll write a book about it. 
I hope it can help right. a couple people here that and there. That would be interesting. Yeah. Sure, that would be great. It is inspirational, though, man. Um, you know, you see people that, that just don't have anything and they do great and then you see people that have a lot and they're just miserable mm -hmm. you know i think it's something to offer there it's an attitude it's a mindset how do you want to feel do you want to be negative and complain about everything or do you want to smile and be happy and bring joy yeah. to the people around you there's a lot of that that's a choice every morning yeah, absolutely. You sit there and you wake up and you say, hey, how am I going to be today? How is this going to work? Like when me and Cody are on our way to school, I say, hey, are you going to have a good day today? Mm -hmm. You know, if the answer is no, that's a problem. Like, right. what are we going to do to make ourselves have a good day today? Right. And how do we, how do we get up, you know, the morning, just spill coffee all over yourself and, you know, there's a mess on the floor from the animal or whatever. And then that's, a, you know, you got to learn how to turn that off. And okay. be like, I'm not going to let that set the tone for my entire day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, is this really that bad in the grand scheme of life? Is a little dog puke going to mm -hmm. ruin my day? Mm -hmm. I'll just make know. a video about it when I'm cleaning up dog puke and make everybody <laughs> laugh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> I said, it happened to me the other day. I stepped in it. I was like, oh, ah! Barefooted? <laughs> yes! <laughs> I was letting the dog out. You know when you like hear the dog? Uh, uh. Oh, so I no. saw it on the carpet and I was like, okay, I'm going to let him out. And as soon as I went to open the door, I stepped in the massive pile that I didn't uh. see on the floor. I was like, oh, oh, oh. I had hopped my way into the bathroom <laughs> to clean it up. <laughs> get anywhere else. It was terrible. I had a dog one time. My mom got me. Uh, they, they got me this stupid puppy, bro, and it was at the house for about 24 hours. I came home from school the next day, and it was gone because my mom stepped in poop. <laughs> she said, it was in between my toes and all oh. this, and that was it. That dog was gone. We never had another puppy in my house after that. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again, dude. I'm going to yeah. turn these cameras off. Y'all know what it is, man. Like, subscribe, share. I think this story right here is awesome. Hit the comments and... and you know, ask questions or, or tell us what you think, man. But yeah, these are heavy. Sometimes. These are heavy. Yeah. See ya.